Hi, my name is Metin Teke, and you're watching Perspectives on Faith. This show aims to explore the expressions of the sacred in faith, in prayer, in ritual, and in theology. We hope to cover both the theological basis of faith as well as contemporary issues relating to faith in today's world. On this edition of Perspectives on Faith, we will talk about the life of Muhammad and his legacy. Our guest today is Dr. Alphonse Taipin. He's a professor of religion at Furman University in Greenville, South Carolina. Dr. Taipin, welcome to our program. Thank you, Martin. Thank you for having me. What religions were present in pre-Islamic Arabia? Right. According to the sources uh, that we have, there were four uh, religious traditions present. We have two, given that the Arabian Peninsula is very close to the Holy Land, one is not surprised to find Jewish communities on the Arabian Peninsula, uh, in the southern part of the uh, peninsula in particular, in what nowadays is the Yemen, uh, there was a strong Jewish presence. Uh, some scholars actually suggest that that was the location of the Queen of Sheba. And then in addition to that, also the city of Medina in particular, that will become very important uh, in the early history of Islam, is said to have housed three major Jewish tribes. Now, in addition to that, you also had uh, Christians present uh, on the Arabian Peninsula. Again, the Arabian Peninsula, when you look at the map, is very close to the Holy Land, so one will not be surprised to find uh, Christian presence. The sources mention in particular Again, in the southern part of the Arabian Peninsula, a variety of Christian tribes. Uh, in addition to that, what is also very interesting is that you find a number of Christian hermits living by themselves in the desert and living a Christian life devoted to the worship of God in solitarity or in, in so uh, solitude, uh, uh, strewn throughout the uh, 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 peninsula and particularly in the desert, Syrian desert. Uh, now, those in addition to those two traditional religious traditions, the vast majority of pre-Islamic Arabs, if we are to trust the sources, will have been polytheists. They will have worshipped multiple gods. We have um, uh, descriptions of the sacred shrine of Mecca, the Kaaba, uh, from pre-Islamic times that tell us that the Kaaba housed up to 360 different deities that were worshipped by Arabs from all over the Arabian Peninsula. Some of these were deities that were tribal representatives of various tribes throughout the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, and then in addition to those three groups, we have a fourth group, and they are referred to as Hanif or Hanifia. Uh, one possible translation is the upright ones. Now these were Arabs that were seekers for a true religion. They were very dissatisfied with the polytheism of their Arabian neighbors. So they are in search of a true monotheism, but at the same time they neither identify as being Jewish nor being Christian. Now it is the polytheists that are really the vast majority as far as we can tell in the city of Mecca. And it is the polytheist worship in Mecca, when you look at the economic situation of Mecca in pre-Islamic times, if we are to trust the sources, we can say that there were two major bases of economic activity uh, in the city of Mecca. One, Mecca was a trade city. Uh, the story has it that Mecca was a trading hub that many caravans that took their origin in the southern part of the Arabian Peninsula, what is nowadays the Yemen, would take valuable stuff, including uh, indigenous products of the Yemen, such as frankincense, and carry it along the Red Sea coast all the way into the Holy Land and beyond into the Byzantine Empire. So we can assume that many of the Meccans were actually involved in the business of trade. They would own camels, and then they would run down to the southern part of the Arabian Peninsula, pick up valuable materials, and then run them on the camel, which has been called the ship of the desert, because it is a very economic way of transporting materials, and would run them through Mecca all the way into the Holy Land. Apart from that, the other very important economic stronghold in Mecca was actually religion, and it was the religious 
polytheistic worship that was associated with the Kaaba itself. Again, the Kaaba housing 360 different deities meant that Arabs from all over the Arabian Peninsula would come to Mecca to, if you want, visit their gods. And usually that visit or pilgrimage of the gods was associated also with economic activities of exchange. So you had a market fair that was attached, in a sense, to uh, the pilgrimage business. Now, this is very interesting and important vis-à-vis -vis the fact of uh, the message that Muhammad is going to receive in the year 610. When Muhammad does start receiving the message of the Quran, it is a message that is, in a nutshell, a message of radical and absolute monotheism. Uh, the Arabs are invited in the message to worship only one God, the one true God, instead of worshiping trees uh, and stones and idols. And so it does not surprise one that when Muhammad starts preaching the message of Islam in public, that the opposition by the Meccan establishment will come quickly and will come harshly. We see already the public preaching of Islam, of this message of radical monotheism in Mecca, begins in 612 or 613, very early on in Muhammad's career. But very quickly, after we have Muhammad starting to preach the message publicly, we have incidents of persecution of a small Muslim community as it arises out of the preaching of Muhammad. Uh, within the first year or so, we already have the first Muslim martyr, uh, who incidentally is a woman. This is very interesting when it comes to uh, the question of uh, women in religion. The first m martyr in Islam, according to most sources, is actually a woman who is dying for this new faith. How was Muhammad's life prior to prophecy? Mm -hmm. Uh, as I said earlier, within these four different groups that we have, I'm referring back to that, we have one group, the Hanifiya, the upright ones. And most sources tell us that Muhammad was of that particular group. That is to say that Muhammad was neither Jewish nor Christian, nor was he actually uh, a polytheist. When you look at uh, the genealogy of Muhammad, later tradition has preserved us this beautiful long genealogy of Muhammad that goes all the way back to the first human being, Adam. Uh, the genealogy runs through Abraham and then Muhammad is said to have descended uh, from uh, uh, Ishmael. Uh, now what is uh, interesting as far as our portrayal of the life of Muhammad is concerned, one interesting fact is that Muhammad was born an orphan. Most traditions have it that he was born in the year 570 of the Common Era. And tradition tells us that his father, in all likelihood, predeceased the son. That is to say, when Muhammad was born, his father had already passed on. And within a couple of years after uh, Muhammad's birth, his mother also passes on, and Muhammad uh, becomes, uh, gets taken in by his paternal grandfather, uh, Abdul Muttalib. Uh, and so that fact that Muhammad was born an orphan uh, tells us that Muhammad grew up in uh, social circumstances that are less than desirable. That is to say, Muhammad did not descend from a spoiled rich man's family, but rather descended from a family uh, whose reputation was very good. When we look at the portrayals, not just of Muhammad, but also of his ancestors. We have in the sources lots of praise about the, truth, uh, the truthfulness and the worthiness of uh, Muhammad's ancestors himself. So one thing that we ought to emphasize is that Muhammad did arise out of uh, social circumstances that were less than desirable. In addition to that, we also have a number of uh, uh, stories that assert that Muhammad himself uh, was unlettered. That is to say, uh, you know, if we were to transpose this into contemporary times, Muhammad did not attend an Ivy League school, but rather he is said to have come from very simple circumstances as far as the family uh, is concerned. 